Hello. Well, we are live with the lovely Lance Shuttler from Ascent Nutrition and the equally lovely Dr. Timo Tastahard, our vet. Um, so how are you both doing? Let's start with you, Lance. How are you doing? Great. It's a beautiful day here in Florida. Um, really looking forward to talking with both of you and sharing some cool things and, of course, learning a lot from both of you and seeing what questions people have. Yeah, that's great. What about you, Timo? How are you doing in Poland? Well, well, I'm pissed because every time we have video with Lance, he's telling us how beautiful the weather is. I, we know it already. <laughs> Shut it. We know it already. <laughs> <laughs> no, the weather, weather is not good yet. <laughs> We're having such a heat wave in the UK. It's absolutely boiling. We haven't had rain for weeks. So everyone who says it always rains in the UK not at the moment so um it's really really hot in here my dogs down here are a bit hot so thank you everyone who's joining us we've got quite a few people who've joining us today and we are going to be talking about continuing our series about how our animals are always trying to communicate with us and give us messages and today we're going to be concentrating on mobility and and also touching on arthritis so everyone in the chat, please do not be shy. Feel free to put your comments in. And then what I'll do is we'll have a chat with Lance and Dr. Timo, and then I will make breaks to go back and answer your questions. So don't be shy. Any questions, put them in the chat. And yeah, we've got someone from rainy northern Norway, but it's beautiful Norway, isn't it? So, um, so let's start with you then, Timo. Mobility is to cover so many different things and it's such a an issue for so many dogs now because we're seeing a lot of what i would call premature aging in dogs and in humans actually so get us started and see so from a vet's point of view some of the main challenges that you're seeing well um thanks so one thing i see for sure is the lack of motion not the mobility because the body adapts to whatever you do and uh, of course for cats and dogs especially cats the life cycle is mostly short and the the gradual change uh, that we normally live in our own lives happen far faster so you have a cat that is extremely active two years long and then suddenly your, your cat shows that it, and your when your cat is nine she's you say oh she's already too old she doesn't want to move and uh, the, the truth is we we feed them so bad and we let them move so badly that the body just shuts down all the unnecessary things and then they get used to it and after that they don't want to move anymore so this is one thing the second part is the effect of bad nutrition on the joints on the immune system on the nervous system that these don't function anymore so we have the functional or let's say behavioral change and we have the metabolic and physical physiological change right and when both come together, we have a premature uh, mobility disaster throughout all the cat and dog population. Yeah, it's something we see a lot, isn't it? It's one, we've spoken about this before, but we'll cover it a bit here in terms of what people consider normal. So I'm constantly shocked when people say, say they've got a nine or 10 year old dog or cat and they're talking about it as old because it shouldn't be considered old at that age at all but starting them off properly in terms of nutrition and exercise is absolutely key isn't it to stopping problems yeah but uh, we shouldn't talk about exercise actually because dogs and cats they're hunters right so uh we have to we have to let them be them so this is the most important part. So if they're not them, they change. And we have to accept that they change. This is not their fault. We have the total control on what the cats and dogs do most of the day. So we just put them in a spot. They cannot hunt anymore. They cannot run. They cannot mimic hunting. And then suddenly we are surprised that their hunting systems are shut down or lessened. And yeah, then the vet bills grow and grow. What do you see where you are, Lance, in terms of let's take a typical dog owner where you are. Um, what would people consider exercise? I know this is a big generalization question, but the reason I'm asking is Timo and I have spoken before that we see a lot of people that think sort of half an hour playing with a ball with, with your dog in the park is enough exercise for a normal dog. And, and that's not what we're, we're calling as appropriate exercise. So what's it like where you are, Lance? 
Um, you know, it certainly is variable for the owner and what their activities or levels are like. Uh, but what I see often, mostly, is people just taking their dogs for walk or their their yeah their dogs for walks. Uh, and of course, that's beneficial and good. But just like Tima was saying, it's you know really not enough. Um, there's some people will who, who will bring their dogs on the beach and throw the ball around and let them run and like really run free. Uh, but mostly, what I'm seeing is and what I've seen throughout most of my life here in the U.S. is people just simply taking them for walks. And you know maybe that's around the block, maybe it's just like down the street. You know, I know in cities in particular, um, you can see dogs living in high rise apartments and, you know, there's almost no nature around there. And you can just imagine that the extent to which their activity is outside of the home is probably just a walk around the block or a couple blocks. So, you know, that certainly is going to accelerate the aging process and accelerate their stiffness and immobility. And, you know, it really is sort of a sad situation for so many pets. Yeah, I see that a lot. And, you know, it's quite interesting just to see people's perception, because I think, you know, we've talked before about the link between, you know, if a person doesn't understand how to feel themselves properly, they're not, they're not going to even think about asking the right questions for the animals. And the same is with exercise, if they're not able to talk about getting their animal, their dog or cat moving properly, if they can't do it for themselves, they're not going to think about it for their animal either, are they? Timo, we've got an interesting question here, and, and I, I'll button on this one as well, about Lorena trying to get her a massage book for her dog, but it's against the law to get it without your vet's permission. So I don't know how it is in the UK, but there are uh, dog physiotherapists, uh, osteopaths, chiropractors, and they all have the right, naturopaths, they all have the right to uh of course uh, uh treat your dog or cat the only problem is um if your dog or cat is uh insured and the insurance is covering it or not but if you're okay with paying from your pocket no you don't need to vet for that there are a lot of different therapists who are able to do it but i don't know the uk law or wherever you are lorena in germany in continental europe you totally can yeah, in the UK, you can't. Most structural therapies, you have to have vet's permission, but it's just a formality. So the vets can't refuse it. And what that is, um, the reason for that, Lorena, is actually meant to be for the pet's best interest in terms of making sure that it's not the, the issue you're taking it to, say, a massage therapist for isn't hiding a deeper problem. Because the sad reality is now there's so many courses available on the internet where you can train to be a therapist in a weekend and actually have really poor quality training. So a lot of it is to protect that you're actually going to a properly qualified person that is going to do good, not do more harm. So it can be frustrating, but it's literally just a formality normally to phone up your vet, explain why it's for and get permission. And then also quite often the vet will ask, you know, who is it to make sure that it's a properly trained registered person that's going to be treating your animal, which is important because there are a lot of people out there now that aren't really um, trained to do a lot of this stuff. There's a lot of sort of internet courses you can get now, which isn't really um, um, appropriate. So it's there, it's frustrating, but it's there often to protect um, the animal. So let's talk then about mobility and what, how you should let a dog or a cat move like a dog or a cat. Do you want to start with that one, Timo? Yeah, sure. So uh, when, I, when I want you to imagine right now a cat or a dog, what, what is it? Tell me, Lance, what is it? What do you think of? When I say cat, what is what you see in your, in your head? Um, a furry little animal. <laughs> Yeah, but how does it move? How does it look? How are the proportions? How um, is the head? What is it doing? Is it pouncing or is it laying? Is it purring or is it uh, is it an active uh, following a fur ball or what is it? Very active uh, and attentive and hyper aware of its environment. Um, exactly. So the hunter, right? The hunter is what you have in your head, not right. not the not the one that's trying to avoid all movement, the big one with the big huge belly, but the one that is fit and right. So the thing is this, <clears throat> form follows function, not the other way around. So uh, the form you can imagine in your head about a cat, 
uh, is its functional form of being a hunter. So if you let them pounce, jump, climb, follow, run, turn, twist, uh, dodge, this is what a cat does. So if you take some of them away and just let some of them happen, the other way, the other ones will not train your cat anymore because they are made to train your cat, also keep your cat fit. So the impulse is the most important thing for the cat, right? So if the impulse is not there, like they don't want to follow something, they don't want to jump, they don't want to hunt, then their body suffers from it because all the nervous uh, connections to the muscles just get numb. So the, the muscles are not used anymore. So because a cat is a highly oxidative animal, uses a lot of energy and tries to save energy, whatever it can, um, yeah, a lot of fibers will be shut down and they are not used anymore. So when then you have this fat cat that cannot jump from uh, one meter away. Normally it could jump like four meters and they fall and they hurt themselves and they go to the vets with broken legs and whatnot, which is unheard of like 100 years ago. So, yeah. Right? And same goes for dogs, but it's even worse. So first we have dogs that are highly uh, efficient in digesting starch. And fat labs, right? Labradors, or most of the retrievers are extremely efficient in digesting food. So they get overweight very quickly. Then they are nurtured and uh, the metabolism goes down. Nobody moves them properly. And then suddenly you have a dog that is just growing and growing and the mobility is getting less and less. The muscles get weaker. The, the joints get weaker. And we have an epidemic of this. This is this is very heavy. I I mean, the only people and dogs in America who are really, really healthy are the ones in Florida that live around gators because they have to run away all the time. But everyone <laughs> else, every, everyone else is not moving. It's like, it's crazy, but it's nobody moves. And because of our own addictions to sitting and computers and not moving and working uh, the way we, we do now, the animals suffer from it. Yeah, I see this a lot. Now, we've got here um, someone with a 21-year-old Jack Russell. Well done. Fantastic. That's really lovely to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we've got a question here about um, a Thai Ridgeback loves two hours exploring in nature. How much is too much exercise? Now, this is quite a tricky one to answer, but I think it's a really good question. Um, who wants to jump in on this one? So I want to go in directly. Um Hunters will go to save energy mode the moment they know it's too much. So if, if, if your animal knows how to move, let them move the way they want, they will know when it's too much and they will shut down the movement. So there is no too much movement. Too much movement happens only if you don't let your animal move a lot and it gets older and then suddenly it feels good for a good reason, then it will overdo because it's like it wanted to move for a long time, right? But other way around, um, normally, if they know how to move and do it all the time, just let them do. And two hours is nothing, like nothing. Yeah. For a hunter, this is nothing. I mean, my dogs, you know, I mean, I don't know if you see mine on the back, they have a minimum of a two-hour walk, a lot of which is off lead every day. Plus, they have a lot of extra time running about in the paddocks and things. Although I will jump in there and give one warning of something I see a lot. And Lance and Timo, feel free to jump in with your opinions. Um, puppies. You have to be careful with puppies. So I see a lot of people say with a Labrador puppy or a Spaniel puppy, taking them out jogging or for really long walks. Oh, that's not a good idea. Now, yeah. that is not a good idea at all. So if, the, if your puppy is playing in the garden or in a field or something, as Tima said, it won't overdo it. But if you take it out on a really long walk, you can put too much strain on their joints because at that yeah. age, and that can cause a lot of long-term damage, and we see it a lot. What about running with um, and cycling with your dogs, Timo? Well, I don't like it normally. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is a good reason for it. First of all, uh, the person rides to their own pace, not to the dog's pace. So, of course, there are some um, dogs who are really good at running long distances and in the same speed of the bike, but not all of them. And I see all these dogs suffering, you know, with very high cadence, trying yeah. to keep up and pushing the heart too much. And don't forget the heart, ours the same, is not made to be pushed too long, too far, in the, in the higher um, um, higher RPM, higher cadence. 
So normally they would push and then they will rest, they will push, they will rest, everything would be reset. And, uh, the way with the bikes is not, not possible. Yeah, I would agree with that. Unfortunately, <coughs> get that a lot where we are. And the Sorry. problem is there's there's quite a few problems. All the ones I agree with with what Timo said. Um, but, you know, also it can lead to behavioural issues in some, particularly if you've got a reactive dog, because a dog would normally only run short, sharp bursts when they're hunting and then yeah. come down again. And if you keep them running for long times, you're keeping their adrenaline levels higher, so they're going to be more reactive. So that can be one issue. Yeah. But also part of what dogs need in their um, exercise uh, is to also sniff and see their environment because they need to exercise their mind, their nose and everything, as well as their joints. So if you're just forcing them to run along on a bike or on a, a jogging with you, you're cutting off a huge amount of one, how they're meant to move, but also what they need, the other aspects from of that they need from their time out in nature. Totally agree. Yeah. Another lady with a 17 year old. Now we're going to come on, sorry, to some suggestions for the older dogs in a minute. And we've got some lovely people that um, really dogs are having some lovely long walks out um, question here from MP, a four pound, or oh bless, Yorkshire Terrier, just a year old, might have a luxating patella on each of her back legs. Yeah, that is very typical for them. So it's it's uh, this is a, mostly a genetic problem. And uh, they might need a small operation just to make the cavity a bit bigger and then fixate the patella. But uh, they should move. And mostly the, the luxating patella don't stop them from moving. So... But yeah, be careful. Don't overdo things. If you can do, just uh, yeah, spread the movement throughout the day a bit so that they can rest whenever they need. And uh, But yeah, normally the solution is yeah, surgery. So in terms of um, dogs meant to move pretty much all day, no, we weren't saying that they're meant to sort of move all day. They will have long rest periods in between. Yeah. But they're a half hour walk <clears throat> not enough for any dog really unless you've got a very old dog or, or a young puppy um they need oh. a lot more exercise than most people realize okay there are some step dogs like uh, saluki or some other uh wind dogs like hounds uh that might go on the longer distance but most of the dogs are highly um oxidative animals using a lot of energy and they have fast twitch muscles that make them jump high dash strong and if they're that type, uh, you cannot expect them to move all day. I mean, we can make a test, take an old English bulldog and uh, tell him to move more than 10, uh, 10 steps and, uh, <laughs> and see where you are at. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, so what about swimming for dogs? Because this obviously some breeds of dogs are much more enjoy swimming a lot more. And there are some safety concerns on that. But what, what's your view on that, Timo and Lance? All right. Um, okay, so it depends how the back of the dog is when it's swimming. So some dogs will push the back up. That's bad. If they swim like that and the, the back is going up all the time, you will have long-term problems if the swimming is very often, quite often. But most of the dogs swim with the butt down and the chest forward and the hands and for them, it's really good. It's a very good exercise, but be careful. Some dogs are really sensitive on their ears after uh, after swimming. So maybe you want to dry it and clean it up. Uh, but otherwise, it's good. Good. Yeah, we have got a um, video on our playlist. If you look at the Vibrant Animal Team playlist on YouTube, where we do talk about some of the dangers they were throwing balls into water. And the dogs swallowing too much water like that. So it's really worth people having a look at that one, isn't it, Timo? Yeah. Now, we've got, just before we get on to some bits that I want to ask Lance about, because I've got lots of questions about that um, for you, Lance, in a minute. But we've got a two-part um, question here from Christina. So she's got a 13-year-old Husky German Shepherd cross. Um, started with a bit of incontinent at night, giving us sleepless nights. Did get some tablets, um, improved a little, but now needs to be let out and licking a lot. I mean, obviously, it's very difficult to give much, you know, information because yeah, we don't know enough. Things. Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of one thing, I would say, you know, I would definitely be looking at what food your dog is on. 
and what diet they're on because obviously that can make a huge amount of difference to so perhaps you can tell us below Christina um and you know a lot of older dogs do have start developing continence issues don't they Timo yeah and that has something to do also with their gut because the gut microbiome plays a huge role in uh, continence and and uh, bladder and all the uh, urethra all the channel uh, all the system for uh, urine extraction is hit by the bad uh, bad choices bad nutrition choices nutritional choices let's say because it and, plays a huge role and also the overuse of chemicals as well so you sure. know looking at are you using any chemical flea treatments vaccinations worming treatments etc um what chemicals are you using in your environment and also what chemicals are you are uh, in the environment that the dog's walking in so for example i'm in the agricultural land or on parks that tend to be heavily sprayed by the people maintaining them. Um, this is quite a good question. Yeah, How I love it. Walk? That's a really good question, Monique. So this is how a dog actually stands, right? So this is the this is how they are. So the more uh, variety you have on the floor, the better it is for the shoulder, for the arms, for the muscles, for the stabilizers. Um, and for the nervous impulses, so different different um, uh, ground types or different footings are super good for every animal, except sometimes uh, uh, knee deep or chest deep mud, which is which can uh, which can cause problem. But otherwise, it's good. Just be careful with, of course, uh, sharp objects, thorns, and this and that. But generally speaking, different uh, grounds are really, really good, Monique. Very good question, and I'm happy that you asked it. And also, the great <clears> thing <throat> is, is when you're on different surfaces, they're also going to be getting lots of other different stimulations because you'll be in different environments, which is really that is correct. Yeah. beneficial. Yeah, Christina is saying that um, he, her dog that we were talking about above, the Husky Cross, has dry food as an actual can with sardines on top. Um, Christine is a, a holistic therapist, all natural. So the diet, we've covered this and other things, that's just not going to be giving your dog the diet that he needs, Christine. You know, there is no such thing as a, as a good um, dry food. Um, and it's just not going to be giving them the the nutrients that, or the variety that they need. So And the I, enzymes, yeah. Yeah, really strongly. I'll put the link in a minute when we go on to the other question. Um, so we've, we're seeing questions about fleas and ticks and heartworms and shampoos. Um, because we're talking about mobility and arthritis, if we have time at the end, we'll come back to those. Um, but yeah, so, to, so getting on to, I wanted to ask you, Lance, because obviously one of the things that people think about comes to the top of their mind a lot nutrition-wise is the omega fatty acids. Um, we've covered on this before about, you know, the problem with fish oils, but can you just talk through a little bit about how important omega fatty acids are for overall um, joint muscle, tendon, ligament health? Yeah, definitely. So every cell in the body uh, has membranes and these membranes are composed of different compounds. And, uh, some of the most important are these omega threes in particular, the DHA and what that's going to do. So that's a polyunsaturated fatty acid. And, uh, what that's going to do is, I mean, a lot of things, but as it relates to mobility and joint health, uh, it's going to help keep those cells fluid and flexible. And so if you think about saturated fats, okay, saturated, it, like, like butter or lard, it sort of hardens at room temperature. And so you can think about it in terms of a cellular membrane, it's sort of going to stiffen it up. Now it is uh, important and necessary, those saturated fats in, of course, moderated amounts, but the polyunsaturated, you can think of those as like more loose and flexible, and that's going to keep the, the cellular membranes and then the cells and then the tissues themselves more loose and flexible. So the actual uh, structure of it, I won't go too deep into it, but the, 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 the tail end of the um, DHA compound is sort of uh, uh, bent off to the side and that actually keeps the, 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 that oil or that polyunsaturated fat, it keeps it fluid and, and moving. 
whereas the saturated one has a different structure and so it kind of locks things in and keeps it more rigid and tense so what the the overall point is that it just keeps the cellular membranes fluid and flexible and there's movement happening and that's absolutely crucial isn't it timo and something that's lacking from in the right quality from most dogs and cats diets that's correct this is the structural problem right so this is uh, where we feed our dogs so bad for such a long time and they are deprived of the most nutrient a uh, key nutrients sorry uh, that if some of the functions are already so impacted when they're two years old, three years old, that they're not good movers anymore. Um, can you imagine you have a 21-year-old uh, son or a daughter and who cannot even run one kilometer? That's what we have in our hands now. And uh, But there is another aspect that I want to talk to Lancer about is that um, the impact of the nervous quality. So nervous system, because every... Okay, muscle cells are like a group of a uh, bunch of kids, let's say 19-year-olds, right? If you don't have a motor unit, a cell that is made out of nervous system, they just do whatever they do or they do nothing. So to make them soldiers, you need a commander, which is the, which is the nervous system cell, the motor unit. And the quality of the motor unit is so dependent on omega-3 fatty acids that, that if there is no signaling, so the muscle cannot react to it and starts to um, uh, get smaller and weaker. So do you see in your research any, any impact on the mobility from the nervous system side for strength and, and um, activity, the quality of um, uh, performance, let's say, Lance? Do you have any, anything on it? Yes, actually, you know, it relates to humans, what, this article that I put together, but we could assume that it's going to apply directly to animals as well. In the uh, same system. Yeah. And so really what happens is the, uh, like you said, the signaling, it's going to happen quicker because, you know, this is sort of uh, down a, a different path, but that DHA in particular, it's facilitating the movement of electricity throughout the brain and nervous system. And so when the cells and the motor units can communicate quicker and more efficiently, then everything works better, especially those fast twitch muscles. And uh, as it relates to human performance, uh, they actually found, they did a huge study across 34 different sports of college, um, college athletes here in the US, and 95% of them weren't even getting 500 milligrams of omega-3s a day. And I mean, that's even still not, not enough to actually have uh, physiological improvements you can maintain at those levels, but to actually improve, you need more. And so the point is that not only athletes, but also the American population in another study was people are at about three to 4% of their omega-3 index, which basically just means how much uh, EPA and DHA are in the red blood cell membranes. And we really need to be at about eight to 12% for optimal function. So here in the U.S., and we can assume it's like this pretty much everywhere else, 95% of the population isn't getting enough DHA and EPA. And so sports performance went down. But when they did studies to show uh, people getting enough, their performance went up. Their recovery time went down. So they're recovering much quicker. Uh, athletes just performing better. Um, you know, just some really incredible stuff as it relates to the brain and nervous system. And like you said, Timo, the brain and nervous system is the operator. It's like the, the driver of the whole body. And if we can give it the most important fatty acid that it needs, DHA, then everything will work better. That's it's, it's funny, isn't it? Uh, also, the importance of um, cell wall and, and nutrient transfer aspect of the omega-3 fatty acids. So that, uh, that whatever comes into the cell and gets out of the cell has a major impact on the cell's health and performance. So that's why I wanted to talk to you about it because I think that we when we talk about uh, omega-3 fatty acids, the only thing we think about, oh, am I inflamed or it mm -hmm. keeps you, you know, it's the, the structural importance or the functional importance so big, like vitamin C, it's so underrated. I don't, I, I don't get it. So it's never yeah. talked about 
and and it's so the the saying you are what you eat is so important and remember our poor pets are completely dependent on us to educate them ourselves properly to give them the right nutrition and and quite frankly there's no commercially bought brand that's good if you're buying any processed food it's going to be nutrition nutritionally depleted so we have got i'll put the links the links are always below the videos for the dog and cat nutrition courses and we're just adding a few new modules. So Lance and Timo have done a brilliant new module about the Amiga oils and, and how the, to use those for your dogs and cats. So anyone who gets the course automatically gets these new modules for free. Timo and I have just done one on bones for dogs and bones for cats. And we're just doing one on detoxing, safe, why you need to detox your dogs and cats and safe options. So these are all free, these upgrades to anyone that gets the course has had it or getting it. So it's so, so important you educate yourself on what your dog and cat needs to feed and feed the best possible that you can afford. And that often means making it yourself. And there's very, it's a lot easier than you think. Um, I do want to touch on this question because this is really crucial to what we're talking about. So um, next guard as wormers. I'm going to start on this one. It's an absolutely horrendous project product with so many awful side effects will completely strip out your dog or cat's microbiome um, and absolutely poly there are loads of self safe options natural options now what options are available vary depending what country you're in so we can't give out i can't give out specific brands here because it's different you all spread all over the world but with very little research you will be able to find safe natural wormers, safe natural flea and tick protection products. Now, sometimes you use them differently. They use more on an ongoing basis than this give a tablet once a month approach. And by using them on an ongoing basis, you're building up a safe natural sort of um, protection against the parasites of whatever they are. So please, please, please don't anyone use NetGuard, NextGuard. It really is horrendous, the amount of problems I've seen with that, pro with that product. So we've got a really good question here. Is it normal for a 10 year old to become a picky eater? No. Um, I would be checking your dog's teeth and mouth and making sure there's not a physical reason for that. And also, Courtney, I would be looking at what you're feeding it because, again, yeah. they need for as much variety in their food as we do almost and so normally it's because they're not getting what they need assuming you rule out a physical problem in the mouth then you're going to be looking at the microbiome not giving out the right signals your dog's not getting what it needs or it's making it feel unwell the current food so you would it's absolutely not normal and something to be taken very very seriously anything else that you two would like to add to that no, but I have two questions I want to show. Yeah, that's great, of course, Tony. That's really good. But the next one from Monique, it's really important. So, um, yeah, so you have to know where your dog or cat is in life. So you cannot just uh, force them to do things they cannot uh, do anyway. If, if your dog, my dog used to show if the floor is wet and he doesn't want to sit, he would go halfway through and then stand up again. Like... Dude, come on. <laughs> I want to, but don't do this to me. And uh, some will do whatever you ask them for, of course. Uh, but yeah, you have to be more in tune with your pet than uh, you possibly are. Everybody I tell needs my to husband off a lot because he asked our dogs to sit and there were loads of holly leaves there. And I was like, right, you take your trousers down and sit on the holly leaves. <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah. ask the dogs to sit somewhere prickly. Yeah. Because yeah, that's that's a good think, thing. You know, it's really important. We've really yeah. prepared to do it. So thank you, Molly. That's really, really good. What about this one from Sally? Ah, yeah, this is an interesting one. If you mean shaking like the muscles are, uh, like small tremors of the muscles, is a different thing than some animals will show uh, that they cannot control the limb for a while. So if they cannot control the limb for a while, it's a nervous issue. And if they, the muscle is shaking, that means the muscle is uh, somehow either overloaded with, uh, with um, how do you say it, metabolic junk, Yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, lactic acid. Sometimes it is a combination of both that the nervous system and the muscles are not in tune. And sometimes it's an issue of uh, being totally tired out of sugar. And uh, when the glycogen is totally gone from the muscle, the muscle might show like uh, 
reaction. And sometimes also some nutrients like calcium, potassium, uh, sodium, they might be all in, uh, out of balance and uh, that can impact one of the one of the organs. And last, I don't want to get too nerdy on this, but sometimes the blood circulation is not equal on both sides. The, your animal might be not straight, the, the, the limbs might not be totally sitting properly. And uh, that has an impact, of course, on the blood circulation. And um, and that has a huge impact on which minerals and which ingredients, which uh, nutrients are reaching the target area. And I would also encourage on the tremors to just check, get uh, uh, something like a Timony chiropractor to have a look and make sure there's not an impingement as well, because it's a talk for a different time. But, you know, a well harness round, rather than a lead around the neck and things like this and obviously any animal can twist and tweak something so that can be an issue yeah well. and it can start at the neck and that obviously very mostly good. starts at the neck yeah very good yeah. point now starlight we do talk a lot about mm -hmm. giving dogs raw vegetables and some fruits and it's in all our nutrition courses so there's loads of people that speak about that and some really good advice about what you can and can't so give your dogs um, so that's all covered in our nutrition courses and, um, yeah, really safe fruits and vegetables that you can give your dogs. Yes, but there is one point. I don't agree that they are omnivores, but yes, uh, veggies and fruits are important. They, they help a lot, but uh, um, I think dogs are not omnivores. Dogs are facultative carnivores. So if you give a piece of meat and piece of watermelon, the choice is mostly on the animal part yeah and yes raw carrots and apples absolutely fine and moderate yeah, it's great. except the seeds apple seeds we have to you have to be careful don't let your dog gobble the apple seeds but the rest is good yeah and um if you can get organic because both carrots and apples are very heavily sprayed with pesticides and herbicides so yeah. Um, we've got few we won't get too much into the data the rules and things but yeah we you know some um, fruit and veg are absolutely okay and essential and you will find a lot of dogs will self-select different grasses and things like that so so long as they're away from sprayed areas roads etc that's very safe for them to do so um so in terms of going it back into the fatty acids and the quality we talk we're talking a lot about quality of how they can get these healthy amigas into their dogs and how vital it is and one of the things, one of the reasons why we love Lance so much is your algae oil that we've got here. Now, the, I know we've covered it before, but we've got new people listening today. So can you talk us through the advantages of using the algae oil rather than the fish oil, which obviously can contain a lot of toxins? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I'll, I'll begin talking about the fish oil because I think it'll be easier for people to work back from that angle. So most people know that if you give fish oil or cod liver oil to animals, in some ways it can help them, uh, but there's also ways that it can be uh, harmful to them, namely because of the heavy metals, the pesticides, the herbicides that are often used in fish farms, and then obviously the heavy metals in the ocean and just all the different contaminants that are in the water. So why do why are animals suggested and humans suggested to use fish oil or cod liver oil the reason is not because of the oil uh, itself from the fish it's because of the oil that the fish eats from the algae so the algae is actually the source of these different fatty acids namely dha and epa those are the two main omega-3 fatty acids and that is the big reason why people say and people know, hey, give your pets fish oil or, you know, cod liver oil. But what you're actually wanting from that, what we as humans want and what the animals want is those omega-3s and then any other sort of fatty acids that are in there. But again, the fish eat the algae. And so the algae is the actual source of the DHA and EPA. And so what we've done with our product, Catherine, is we do a water-based extraction of the algae and uh, it's grown in hermetically sealed tanks, very pure, clean water. Uh, and the strain of algae that we have is a very old strain. And it, we actually, because of the water extraction method that we do, we don't use hexane or CO2. Uh, hexane will definitely leave residue. Uh, the CO2, I know that Timo knows more about the CO2 process than I do, but 
those two processes and methods aren't clean like a water-based extraction. So there's algae oil companies out there that are doing that. Uh, we're the one that's doing the water-based extraction. And so what we have is a pure, clean product where we don't even have to add in other seed oils like other companies do because they have to keep the the oil stabilized and keep it from oxidizing. And then they just do things you know, with their process too. But it's literally just the algae oil, DHA and EPA and a whole host of other uh, fatty acids that we've got in our product. And then uh, tocopherol as the uh, antioxidant to preserve it from oxidizing. So it's a pure, clean product that comes from the original source of these fatty acids, which is algae. Yeah. And the results that I've seen, because I work with a lot of dog and cat clients all over the world, and the results that I've had is unanimous. Um, one, a lot of the dogs and cats will actually self-select the albiol, which is showing that their body needs it, but also that the pet parents are noticing a big improvement um, to all sorts of aspects of their animal's health when introducing it. So certainly it's something that's a core part that I put on the side of the dish for the, the, the dogs and cats to have every day with my animals. Um, and they get more of it than I do. <laughs> so, and I was using it with hers as well, along with the pie bro, um, product. Yeah. Lovely. Any other comments on that, Timo, before we move on to the next question? No, I think everything is said, but uh, quality uh, plays such a huge role. And quality, I don't want to talk about quality much because of the price and everything. But uh, quality means sometimes just raw. Quality means uh, less processed. Quality means uh, cold press. Quality means water extracted. Qual I mean, it's not just, uh, we're not trying to tell you buy the most expensive thing because it should be more uh, higher quality. But what, I tr what we try to tell is um, there are more ways of making the same product and the quality of the production and of the process plays a huge role in the quality of the product itself. It's not just the, the end product, right? Yeah, absolutely. And Timo, to your point about the price, we actually priced our product very strategically to where we have more DHA than any other algae oil company out there per, let's say, 100 milligrams of DHA per, per dollar or however you want to calculate it. Uh, we have the best price product out there in the market that I've seen, uh, at least in terms of here in the US. Um, and of course, for any of this sort of like uh, what you call higher quality fish oil products, if there is such a thing, uh, it would be that we're, we're also beating that. So we not only have the pure, clean, original source, we also can do it in a way price wise where it's the most affordable for people. And that that to me is powerful because just like you said most people equate quality or like the, the purest best product out there well i'm going to be spending so much more money than you know what i'm spending now we've actually priced it in a way where it's not that we want to get this out there to as many people and animals as possible and so we put it at that price great yeah it's really really important point thank you for making that so and um you know team and i are incredibly fussy <laughs> about what products we use and recommend and we do a lot of research before we recommend anything um as lance knows we're very fussy um so a, co a comment here on diatomous food grade earth um added to a dog's water um now first of all it depends what you're looking to do with it for while you're adding it um, I am not a fan of DE used internally. I know a lot of people are, and I know a lot of people use it for parasite control. And I use it as an external, uh, as an ingredient in a homemade flea powder for external use. But the way the DE uses, if you're using it poly for um, parasite control, the way that it kills the parasites or itself to kill the parasites is because it's very sharp and it breaks down the exoskeleton of the parasites. But if it's going to break down, if it's sharp enough to break the exoskeleton and the parasites, then for me, it's sharp enough to damage the very delicate mucosa um, membrane of the intestinal tract. So I, for that reason, I don't recommend DE internally, although a lot of people do. Have either of you two got a comment on that at all? 
Um, I don't have a comment on it, but I, I, I learned something from you, Catherine. So, Timo, if you've got something to share, please. Well, I totally agree. Um, and the uh, same goes for uh, finely ground eggshells. They are the same, yeah. bit, like very sharp, small object. Um, but she's talking more about just mixing a bit into the water. Um, I think from time to time is not a very bad idea, but I wouldn't do it regularly because you don't want to have those sharp crystals constantly in the digestive tract. I wouldn't like to. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, come on. Yeah, so we actually, um, so, so I'll, I'll ask the question, what do you both think about humic and fulvic acid then as, say, a replacement for the diatomaceous earth? Or as a oh, that's a total, a total different ball game. It's, it's, right. uh, yeah, it's a total different ball game. It's like you are asking me, um, should I throw a boulder on your head or a nice shower? So which one do I choose? Yeah, I... Uh, the shower. <laughs> Timo loves, I absolutely love fulvic and humic acid. So long as it's well sourced and well produced, I um, have been a fan of that for absolute years. And I think it's got so many benefits to all species. And I've been using it for all species for a long while. I think, again, the thing is, is people need to be very careful with the sourcing of it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, but uh, there are two or three more acids like that, fulvic, humic, um, and uh, and some other acids and these are all of course normally uh, connected to the earth minerals and the uh, microbiome so uh, if your environment is uh, lacking in earth minerals then these help tremendously with the gut health tremendously yeah um we've got a um miwi has <laughs> got a thing her dog has a tremor which lays down horizontally should you consider infrared therapy but um, the hunch hunch is important so hunch yeah. is the hunch is the trick so infrared therapy i don't even know any time infrared therapy is not good except some skin issues so i don't see it as a therapy i see it as a wellness mostly of course it's a therapy but i would say it's not like something that you only have to do when when you are in trouble you can also do it just to stay healthy and keep yourself uh, fit so I don't see it as a problem, but I think there is a more of a structural problem there you have to cho yeah. uh, solve. Uh, I don't know what dog it is, how big, how heavy, how big the belly, how heavy the head, how tight the neck. Uh, sometimes a small trick with the two fingers can solve a huge problem on the neck and on the back because, yeah, our small uh, friends have four limbs and they have a huge connection between the tail and the head. And anything that goes wrong on this connection has a direct impact on the rest of the lips. So um, I think a therapist, a massage therapist or a vet or someone who understands uh, the backbone very well will help you out. Yeah. So there's some really good therapists. A properly trained red light therapist um, will be able to help you out. Um, a many um, practitioner, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Okay, so a couple more questions. Um, colloidal silver in the water regularly, um, can it help? I'm not a fan at all. Um, do you want me to go first or you to go first, Timo? I think we've got... No, both. no, you go first. I talk too much already. Um, look, well, colloidal silver, I absolutely love. Complete opposite to almost what Timo was saying about the infrared therapy. Colloidal silver, I love as a topical application for if there's a wound that you need to clean or heal or anything. So I've absolutely got some in my first aid kit, but I wouldn't use it internally on a regular basis um, because silver bioaccumulates and it will build up in the body. So I, I absolutely would not add it regularly to the water, no. Um, for me, silver has no use in the body internally, so the body doesn't like it. Um, there are different minerals that compete with each other and silver competes with gold and the brain needs gold and your body loves gold and hates silver. So, and the problem is your body has huge trouble or the dog's body to get rid of the silver. It bioaccumulates, like uh, Catherine said. So what's it's inside is inside. In some cases like extreme uh, Lyme disease or joint uh, infections or heart infections, it might help. But uh, it's there forever and it kills every bacteria it touches. 
the good ones and the bad ones, and it doesn't discriminate. And this is a huge problem. That means it will kill whenever you have the water full of uh, silver, it will kill whatever it touches. And um, that's not the right way to have a healthy <laughs> microbiome, let's say, right? throwing atomic bombs on them constantly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's much safer options. Personally, I would use CDS. And if you don't know what that is, you'll have to sign up to my Telegram health channel. The link is below because I can't say it on YouTube. And I would also be looking at humic and fulvic acid. So it depends what you're using it for as well. And, yes, I completely agree. Starlight dogs do have very similar um, health issues to humans. And most of our dogs' health issues are actually caused by the humans. Um, we have Eve... We have covered why Timo and I personally don't recommend DE as a wormer. We've just sort of covered that. Um, so um, in terms of sort of finishing this off for people, if there's no final questions for people, um, absolutely lots of people asking about homemade wormers and three. It's so, so important. There's some really good recipes out there, um, lots of good natural products and, and not – not putting these unnecessary chemicals in or onto your dogs and cats is really, really important. Um, so that's a great place to start. Nutrition is key to everything. You know, if the nutrition's wrong, everything else is wrong. So we've got some good links below the videos. We've got a dog and cat nutrition course. We've got the link to all of Lance's um, products for Ascent Nutrition, including the algae oil and the other ones. Um, was that a little teaser for us that you've got to tell us something about the humic and fulvic, Lance? Anything you want to share with that? Uh, wow, Catherine, great, great insight and intuition. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Um, uh, we should have a, our products coming um, later this month. It should be here in a couple of weeks. Now, it's going to be in capsule form because it's you know, mainly marketed for humans, but pets, you can just easily break open the capsule, just a veggie capsule. You can just slide open and just dump the powder out and uh, use it as you wish. So I would ask both of you, what do you think the best way then to use that powder for pets would be? Um, I think you. Know, I'd need to have a look at the formula and what the concentrations are so that to have a look in it. So you can either add it to your animal's food or you can also put a little bit on the side of the food and see if they self-select it as well. Um, so, but because I haven't seen the specific formula, I'm really looking forward to seeing that because I think that's a really fantastic addition to your product range, Lance. I'm very, very happy to hear that. Yeah, yeah. if you are at it, Lance, check also valeric acid to add to it because it has a huge impact. So if you can mix the three. Which one? Valeric acid. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be um, okay. So there is the bacteria produce different type of acids, and this has its own cycle, right? And valeric acid is an important uh, step there, and has a effect like a hum humic or fulvic acid. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, look, so, you can look into it. I will, I will, and I'll share just briefly. We can talk more about it once we launch it, but the source of what we've got, so. We're getting it from New Mexico and it's in a place where uh, it's on indigenous land and it's blessed by the indigenous and the people that we're working with, uh, you know, have a very good relationship with them. And the particle size of the humic acid is actually 20 times smaller than most other humic acids out there. And it's done through a strict mechanical process. No, no electricity, no heating, no solvents, none of that. Uh, just a process that literally just refines it to even a smaller particle size. And so what that's going to mean is that the absorption will go way up and it'll get in those cells even more powerfully and, and even more uh, probably quickly than humic and fulvic already does. Great. Excited. I can't wait to share that. I can't wait to look at <clears> it <throat> myself and then um, share it with the listeners. So just a final more comments. Thank you so much, as always, for your lovely participation, everyone. Some really great questions, as usual. Um, Starlight's got a comment. Um, I believe you can detox a dog with their species-specific diet and natural herbs, just like humans. You got any comments on that, you two? Yeah, for sure. They are not omnivores. They are carnivores, but facultative. That means they choose to be carnivores. 
they can survive on other things, but they like to be uh, carnivores because they need specific nutrients. But yes, you can detox. We will have a course about that as part of yeah. the dog nutrition course, detox. Uh, but um, it's not as straightforward as you might think because today's diet, whatever you give, is totally filled with stuff that doesn't belong to the animal's body. So detoxing them for natural stuff that needs to be detoxed is totally different than the artificial stuff where the body doesn't know even where to put it, right? Yeah. So that's a bit of a more complicated issue than just giving them the right diet and thinking that it will go away, which it won't, by the way. And that's something, um, putting praise myself a bit here, but this is something I've spent the last 20 years specializing in about how to safely detox humans and all species of animals, which is why I put so much research into the different products, because like Juno said, you absolutely need to know what you're doing, because even with a lot of natural products and style like this comes onto your other comments below about using natural herbs for worming. Absolutely. But if you really don't know what you're doing, please, please, please buy an already approved natural product because with <coughs> these natural products, you can also do a lot of harm if you don't know what you're doing, how to use them properly. So natural is always best. But, you know, um, if you're learning at the starting of your learning, if you're experienced and been doing this for a while, absolutely make your own formulas. If not, use one that's already been formulated by an expert whilst you're building up your own research to do it yourself. And just a final question for you, Lance. Um, so the dog with the shaking um, leg, um, where is it? Um, the lovely little dog that we talked about at the start with the shaking leg. So as well as the algae oil, are there any other of your products that you would recommend? Um, I mean, you could look at the pine pollen. That would be really the only other one that I would look at um, at the moment. Of course, when we've got the humic, uh, but the pine pollen is really the only one at the moment I would look at. Yeah, and I think definitely your Sally, um, we will um, do another show in a few weeks' time when the team and I have had a chance to look at it with Lance on the humic and fulvic because that could be really important. And then obviously we've already talked about looking at the diet as well. And um, you will be, if you have got, I don't know if you've already got the dog nutrition course, but as I said, within a few weeks, we will have the detox module and the algae module and the bone module um, added to that. So whenever anyone buys it, they'll get those modules for free. So the detox module is going to be really crucial as well, because sometimes the shaking can be a result of sort of heavy metals or other toxicity in the system as well. So that's going to be very useful for you. So thank you so, so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, Lance, thank you so much. Timo, thank you so much. Um, the links, as always, under this video, there's a little drop-down description box and all the links you need for anything you want um, from Lance's shop, for the courses, how to contact us, is all on that link below. Uh, we will be back in a couple of weeks' time for the next one in this series. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Any final words from you two? Well, um, we had one comment from, uh, hello from uh, Denmark. Yeah, it's Visionary Endeavors by Susan. And I just wanted to show this little Lego thing here. here <laughs> to say hello to Denmark. This is one thing. <laughs> but the most important thing is uh, don't think that... Um, the mobility issues with your animals come just by themselves. So they just don't happen because your dog or cat is getting older. They're happening because of things you do or you don't do. So uh, you have to take care of this. So it's uh, this is not uh, something that just happens, right? So same goes for your children. If your children are not mobile, then this is possibly about something that you do or not do. Because normally the body is made for survival and uh, and it will improve accordingly. Very yeah. well said, Timo. It's yeah. so true. And one thing I would say is it's really, it, this is never about beating ourselves up. We all do the best we yeah, can sure. with the information we've got. 
But the thing is, one of the whole reasons we're doing this series is because we all learn from our mistakes. But what we want to do is make sure we learn from them and come up with constructive ways forward. Now, on our um, Vibrant Animal Team playlist video, we've got one on exercise. We've got all sorts of content that Timo and I have been doing over the last few years on there, all completely free. Um, so please, please do... Um, you know, um, have a look at those informations because there's lots of good information. And the more we educate ourselves as animal parents, the better their lives are going to be and the better theirs. Um, and um, yeah, um, Starlight, yes, I'm an iridologist as well. And absolutely, you can um, read your dog's irises. That's one of the things that I do um, with horses, dogs, cats and everything. Um, so yeah, iridology is amazing to tell you what's going on. So thank you so much for everyone joining us. Brilliant questions, as always. And we will see you again in a couple of weeks. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Bye.